What what made you have that decision to start tattooing uh, your face? In my mind, I was done acting. Oh, so you at one point you just said, I'm done. By the time I wasn't doing my grades, even my agents was like, all right, we ain't messing with you. I had already put it in my head like, hey, I'm done with acting. They was trying to uh, play me like a rookie, talking to me and stuff in interrogation, talking in circles. And once they seen that it wasn't going nowhere, that's when they finally was like, you're here for how long after the incident were you arrested? Probably like four minutes after. Hollywood is filled with stories of child stars struggling in the industry and facing numerous scandals. One who has been the victim of it is no other than DJ Daniels. DJ Daniels' journey from a clean-cut kid to a life tangled up in trouble is one that few expected. It's a familiar narrative, child stars with bright beginnings who later find themselves on a downward spiral. DJ Daniels. This is him when he was doing the show. Okay. Okay, you remember that, right? Okay, I did. Cute, cute kid, 10 yeah. years old. What's for Christmas? A little white boy. <laughs> hey, on your next math test. Uh, I don't know, maybe like two? My beard. I woke up with a whisk. This is what he looks like now. God damn. Woo. It's a big game. Uh, is that tattoos all over his Those face? Those are tattoos all over his face. DJ Daniels, who once had a promising future, saw his life take a darker turn, leading to a series of unfortunate events. Born on October 17, 1988, in Montclair, California, DJ spent his first couple of years in Compton before his family relocated to the Inland Empire. Known by friends and family as DJ, he grew up in Fontana. His parents, seeing his potential, started taking him to auditions when he was still very young. To give DJ a shot at a better life, his parents got him into the entertainment biz when he was just about five years old. He quickly snagged an agent and started booking gigs. His first big break was a Honey Nut Cheerios commercial, and that really set the stage for him. After that, he popped up in a bunch of shows like A Fall From Grace on Ella Kuja's show, where he had a recurring role in seven episodes. That's when acting started to feel really real for him. He also made appearances in The Wayans Brothers, Family Matters, and Coach. Not long after, DJ scored a role in a McDonald's Deluxe Space Jam commercial, sharing the screen with none other than Michael Jordan. His career was off to a promising start, with small parts in shows like Grace Under Fire and In the House, which starred LL Cool J acting alongside LL. Cool J was a dream come true for the DJ, who along with his dad was a big fan of the rapper turned actor. After In the House ended, DJ continued to pick up roles in popular TV shows, appearing in series like Coach, Family Matters, and The Wayans Bros. These gigs eventually led to his big break on The Hewleys, a sitcom that followed a black family's move from the inner city to suburban Los Angeles. On the show, DJ played the son of DL Hewley. The Hewleys aired from 1998 to 2002, running for four seasons before it was cancelled. However, this role was a huge turning point, bringing in more money, better homes, and fancy cars for DJ and his family. The show was a big hit, running for four seasons and 89 episodes, with DJ in every single one. It was his big break. Even after the Hewleys ended, DJ Daniels kept finding roles in TV shows like ER, The Bernie Mac Show, and even movies like Sky High. He also appeared in Cold Case and Fireflies. However, after Fireflies, his acting career began to slow down significantly. At just 13, he went through a tough time with his parents splitting up, struggling with school, and being out of the acting scene for months. Months. DJ started skipping school and his grades began to drop. This academic slump made it harder for him to land acting jobs, as maintaining good grades was a must for young actors. He felt like his acting career was over, and in a mix of frustration and rebellion, at 19, DJ made a bold decision and began getting face tattoos, something most actors would probably steer clear of. For many in the industry, their face is their livelihood, so they take great care to keep it pristine. But for DJ, things were different. Even his agents had given up on him, leaving him to feel like he was just another victim of Hollywood typecasting. After spending four years as a kid on The Hewleys, he found it nearly impossible to land any roles as an adult. And I was getting other type of gigs, so I wasn't really feeling the acting. I was doing it since I was five. Right, because you're typecast in a way as th the kid, the little kid. DJ said, in my mind, I was done with acting by the time I wasn't doing well in school and wasn't getting any more gigs. Even my agents were like, all right, we're not working with you anymore. I had already decided, yeah, I'm done with that. I wasn't really getting the gigs I wanted. I wanted more gigs that suited me. You know what I'm saying? Instead, I was getting other types of roles, so I wasn't really feeling the acting anymore. I had been doing it since I was five. In my mind, I was done acting. 
by the time I wasn't doing my grades and stuff and I wasn't getting no more gigs and even my agents was like, all right, we ain't messing with you. I had already put it in my head like, hey, I'm done with acting. I wasn't really getting the gigs that I wanted. During this challenging time, DJ reconnected with his old neighborhood in Compton and started hanging out with Bop and the Ludak Park Pirates, a gang on the east side of Compton. Although his acting days seemed behind him, DJ still believed he had a bright future and was trying to break into the rap scene. He kept a low profile for a few years, but by 2011 his name was back in the headlines, though not for the best reasons. Unfortunately, things took a dark turn on August 5th, 2011. Around 2 a.m., DJ was at a sports bar in Stockton with some friends including Joanne and Marcus. As the night progressed, DJ, Joanne, and Marcus began flashing gang signs at another group in the bar, which included JJ, Ashley, Kendra, Armid, and Aaron. Allegedly, JJ and his crew were linked to the crib, while DJ and his friends were associated with the blood. As the bar was closing, gunshots rang out from down the street, unrelated to any of the people involved. The gunfire caused everyone to rush out in a panic, adding to the tension of the night. After leaving the bar, JJ spotted Marcus, DJ, and Joanne walking in the street, still calling out gang-related language. And what followed was a night that would change everything. Marcus walked up to JJ and demanded to know where he was from, but Marcus wasn't backing down. He took a stance ready for a fight, and DJ, along with Dwayne, who was nearby, started moving closer to JJ as if to corner him, sensing the danger. Several members members of JJ's group quickly came to his defense, and a brawl erupted between the two groups. The fight escalated rapidly, turning violent. JJ was stabbed multiple times, and his friend Taylor, who tried to shield him, was also injured in the chaos. A young man by the name of JJ ended up getting stabbed to death. Rest in peace. The night, already spiraling out of control, took an even darker turn, marking a pivotal downturn in DJ's life. DJ was hustled into a car and taken to the 500 block of Garfield Avenue, where they waited for an ambulance. However, the ambulance had difficulty reaching the scene due to more gunfire occurring down the street. Tragically, JJ Lewis didn't survive his injuries and passed away at the hospital that night. Before this fatal event, DJ had a few brushes with the law, including minor charges like outstanding misdemeanor warrants possession, and driving without a license. But these previous issues were minor compared to the serious trouble he was about to face. Just hours after the stabbing, DJ was arrested and charged with premeditated gang-related activity, and other serious offenses. His attorney quickly filed a motion to dismiss the charges, arguing that DJ had no idea a fight would break out and that he wasn't the one who wielded the knife or stabbed JJ. If this motion had been successful, it could have ended DJ's legal nightmare. Unfortunately for DJ, the motion was denied. Prosecutors maintained that DJ and his friends had been throwing gang signs, making the incident appear like a targeted gang hit. According to a report by Vlad TV on YouTube, at just 21 years old, DJ was facing a first-degree which carried a minimum sentence of 25 years and could potentially result in life in prison if convicted. Were you facing life in prison? Yeah. And you're how old at the time? 21. While DJ was being held on a charge, he was denied bond, but he was determined to fight the accusations. He pushed forward with a jury trial that kicked off toward the end of 2012. In a surprising twist, D.L. Hewley, who played DJ's father on TV, took the stand as a character witness. He spoke up for DJ, sharing insights into the young man's life and vouching for his character. Leading up to the trial, D.L., you actually came in as a character witness. Sure. Okay, whose idea was that? Hey, uh, well, I would've came anyway. Hewley was open about his own past connections to the Bloods when questioned, which brought its own set of challenges. Prosecutors tried to use this against DJ, suggesting that Hewley's testimony was just one gang member covering for another. They attempted to portray DJ as being involved with the same gang, casting doubt on the credibility of Hewley's support. To me, I was never just his step, I mean, his TV dad. I was, to me, I, he was my kid to me, and I should have said something. And I, the one thing I felt instantly was guilty. As reported by RecordNet, the trial revealed that DJ's 26-year-old friend, Marcus McClyman, was actually the one who stabbed JJ Lewis. This crucial detail led the jury to acquit DJ and another co-defendant, 27-year-old Dwan Nunley of all charges. I don't think the victim got the justice he should have gotten, said San Joaquin County Deputy District Attorney Janet Smith, who prosecuted the case. I feel badly. Smith mentioned that after the trial, she spoke with the jury, and they didn't bring 
bring up Hewley's testimony on Daniels' behalf. She felt that Hewley's hour-long testimony didn't have much impact on the jurors. According to Smith, Hewley also admitted in court that he had previously been involved with the Blood Street Gang. McClyman took full responsibility for Lewis's death, clearing DJ and Nunley of any involvement, as noted by Vlad TV on YouTube. While McClyman was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter, he was acquitted of first-degree charges. DJ and Nunley were released, but McClyman was sentenced to 11 years in prison. In an interview with Vlad TV, DJ expressed his emotions and how he felt when his friend was imprisoned. He said, I was really sad because I got him moved next to me, so we were cellmates. Packing up and then having to look at him and leave my brother, that wasn't smooth, you know what I mean? It wasn't smooth at all. That hurt, so I couldn't really enjoy my freedom. They got to tell me that I'm going home, but my big homie, my brother, they telling me he's staying. That's Marcus. Marcus. I was really sad because I got him moved by me. So we're sellies. Mm. So me packing up, then I got to look like this and leave my brother. That wasn't smooth. You know what I mean? That wasn't smooth at all. That hurt. Yeah. So I couldn't really enjoy my freedom. He further stated, My social media blew up and some people reached out to me. Actually, it was mostly girls, not even guys. I'm not really sure why. I know I tried to go see Marcus after I got acquitted. I tried to go back to Stockton to see him. You know, to show my brother that I miss him and love him. But my mom wasn't having it. She called all my uncles and other big relatives on me. She did a lot. Seeing how worried she was, I remembered how she used to always have to go down there for me. I would tell her, Mom, chill, I got this. But she always felt like she needed to be there for me, giving me that energy. So she went down there a lot. A real lot. So I chilled out and listened to her. Like I said, she called a lot of my uncles on me. They were like, you're going back to Stockton? And I was like, yeah, man, I gotta go see Marcus. But they were like, that's stupid, whoop de whoop And my mom said the same. So I was like, all right, and just chilled. Right now, DJ Daniels is living a low-key life, and it's still up in the air whether he'll get another chance at acting. However, he would drop music now and then, and some of his tracks talked about overcoming tough situations and his past with the Bloods. He said, right now I'm working on music and actually, me and the sister who played on The Hewleys, Monique Clark, have been keeping in contact. Over the last two months, she hit me up, and she has some really great ideas that I'll let her talk about when she's ready to put it out. So we've been in touch, and I feel like we've got something strong coming up together. Working on music right now, and uh, actually, me and the sister that played on The Hewleys, Ashley Monique Clark, we keep in contact. He often rapped about his friend Marcus, who had served 12 years for a case they were involved in. DJ showed his support by frequently wearing free Marcus shirts in his videos and mentioning him in his songs. Since he only released music sporadically, his music career didn't really take off. Hollywood has seen its share of tragic stories involving child stars whose careers and lives take a nosedive. Sometimes it's just about these young actors not landing roles as they grow older and their youthful appeal fades. Other times, the stories turn much darker, involving serious allegations and crimes that abruptly end their careers. Take Orlando Brown, for example. In the early 2000s, he was a familiar face on Disney Channel, known for playing Eddie Thomas on That's So Raven. He had the charisma and talent to win over audiences, but in recent years, his name has been linked more to legal troubles and substance A. In 2016, TMZ reported that Brown was arrested in Torrance, California, after a violent incident with his then-girlfriend in a police station parking lot. Brown had driven to the station during a heated argument, and a witness saw the altercation and called the cops. When the police detained him, they discovered methamphetamine on him, leading to charges of possession with intent to sell, having contraband in jail, and domestic battery. Two years later, Orlando Brown ran into trouble again, this time in Las Vegas. He was busted for burglary after he changed the locks at Legends Restaurant and Venue, owned by Danny Boy, a former Death Row Records artist. Security cameras caught Brown entering the kitchen and then covering the camera lens with a rag. TMZ reported that Brown and Danny Boy had been friends, and Danny Boy hoped pressing charges might help Brown get back on track. Additionally, in 2014, an audio clip surfaced where someone allegedly heard Brown threatening a woman with violent language. Brown denied it was him and claimed the woman was just a stalker. Despite these issues, Brown made a hopeful announcement in 2021, stating that he had kicked his 
addiction after attending a Christian-based rehab. It was a positive step in his chaotic life, but it highlights how fame and fortune can sometimes lead to a downward spiral. Next on the list is Marcus T. Polk, who many remember as the cheeky little brother Miles Mitchell from the 90s show Moisha. In 2013, Polk made headlines for all the wrong reasons when he walked into a Los Angeles jail and turned himself in. He was accused of seriously assaulting his girlfriend, Andy Rocks, leaving her with internal injuries that required hospital treatment. TMZ reported that their argument started in a Beverly Hills nightclub when Polk felt Rocks wasn't giving him enough attention. The fight continued at their home, where Polk allegedly attacked her. Three months later, Polk was facing domestic violence and battery charges, potentially risking a four-year prison sentence. However, in 2014, he reached a plea deal that spared him jail time. Instead, he agreed to a year-long domestic violence treatment program and was ordered to stay at least 100 yards away from Rock X. Sadly, Pock's legal issues didn't end there. Just a year after avoiding jail, he was arrested in Scottsdale, Arizona, on the eve of the Super Bowl for DUI <laughs> possession. Pock eventually pleaded guilty to the DUI charge, though the <laughs> charge was dropped. He was given 12 months of probation and required to complete an alcohol treatment program. Ryan Grantham looked like he had a bright future ahead with roles in Diary of a Wimpy Kid, in shows like Supernatural, iZombie, and Riverdale. But things took a dramatic turn. In September 2022, Ryan was sentenced to life in prison for his 64-year-old mother, Barbara Wayatt. In Canada, a second-degree conviction means an automatic life sentence, with the judge determining when he might be eligible for parole. The decision was that Ryan won't be eligible for parole until 2036. CBC News reported that the tragic event happened on March 31, 2020. At the age of 21, Ryan shot his mother while she was playing the piano at their home in Squamish, British Columbia. What made the situation even more chilling was that Ryan filmed himself confessing to the crime and showing Barbara's body. The next day, he arranged candles around her covered body and hung rosary beads from the piano. Then he packed weapons into his car and drove towards Ottawa, reportedly planning to assassinate Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. But Ryan's plans didn't stop Stop there. He also intended to attack his school, Simon Fraser University. Instead, he ended up at the Vancouver Police Department where he confessed to the At his 2022 sentencing, Ryan expressed deep regret, saying, I can't explain or justify what I did. I have no excuse. It pains me to think about how I've wasted my life. Then there's Jeremy Jackson, who was a well-known face on Baywatch as the young Hobie Buchanan. By the time he turned 35, his life had taken a dark turn. In 2015, he was arrested in Los Angeles for stabbing a woman multiple times in her arms, legs, and back during an attempted car theft from her boyfriend. Jackson was later found at a hotel and charged with assault with a deadly weapon and making criminal threats. After posting bail, he headed straight to a rehab facility. In 2017, Jeremy Jackson ended up serving 270 days in LA County Jail and got five years of probation after he pled no contest to the charges against him. It was a long way from his days of Baywatch fame. On an episode of E's Child Star Confidential, he talked about how his early success took him down a dark path. I probably made between two to three million dollars from Baywatch. I had everything I needed to ruin my life. Lots of money and people around me who weren't real friends but I thought they were. I ended up getting caught up in a downward spiral, he said. His drug of choice? Crystal meth, which really threw his life off course. Then there's Lilo Brancato, who first made waves with his role in A Bronx Tale back in 1993 when he was just 17. He later appeared in Crimson Tide and The Sopranos. However, in 2009, Brancato was sentenced to 10 years in prison. The trouble began in 2005 when he tried to break into the home of a friend, Kenneth Scavotti, looking for what he didn't know was that Scavodi had died months earlier. During the break-in, they were confronted by 28-year-old off-duty police officer Daniel Enchautegui, who lived next door. Armento, Brancato's accomplice, ended up shooting and the officer, which led to a life sentence for him. Brancato, who claimed he didn't know Armento had a gun, was hit with charges. Even though Lillo Brancato was cleared of he was found guilty of attempted burglary. The judge made it clear that the situation was severe, as a brave young police officer lost his life because of Brancato's actions. Brancato served his sentence and was released in 2013, hoping to get his acting career back on track. Edward Furlong's story is another tough one. He shot to fame as a child star in Terminator 2 Inches, alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger, but as he grew up, began to take a serious toll on his life and career. 
In 2013, he was arrested in West Hollywood for allegedly assaulting his ex-girlfriend, even violating a protective order she had against him. He ended up serving just under three months in jail. Though he pled no contest to domestic violence, six other charges, including witness intimidation and vandalism for smashing the woman's laptop, were dropped as part of a plea deal. He was sentenced to five years probation, required to attend domestic violence counseling, and had to complete a 90-day rehab program. In a 20 2022 interview with the Daily Mail, Furlong revealed he had been sober for four years. He managed to overcome his addiction after getting arrested for possession and checking into rehab again in 2017. Reflecting on his past, Furlong said, When I was younger, I didn't have many people looking out for me, and I was left to my own devices. I didn't know how to manage my money and lived a very unnormal life. I was almost set up for addiction. It's heartbreaking to see so many child stars end up in tough spots, but it's great to see some of them making a comeback. Hopefully, we'll get to see them back on our screens in the future. That's it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching.